Good morning, and welcome to worship for this Sunday, September 6th, Labor Day weekend. So, happy Labor Day, all. I am Pastor Susan Forsyth. Yes. Uh, with me today to bring liturgy and prayer is Susie Francis. I'm uh, recording us as Steve and on the piano, Marina. So welcome to worship with Luther Memorial Church. I would just encourage you this week to look out for an important message and email concerning our worship. And please know that we are working very busily to adapt worship um, so that we can gather soon all together at our building or grounds. So we look forward to that opportunity. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us join together now in the confession and forgiveness. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Beloved, God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. Let us pray together now the prayer of the day. O oh Lord God, Enliven and preserve your church with your perpetual mercy. Without your help, we mortals will fail. Remove far from us everything that is harmful and lead us toward all that gives life and salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The first reading today comes from the book of Ezekiel, the 33rd chapter. So you mortal, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked ones, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways. The wicked shall die in their iniquity, but their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Now you, mortal, say to the house of Israel, Thus you have said, Our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read responsibly Psalm 119. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your teaching. I shall keep it with all my heart. 
Lead me in the path of your commandments, for that is my desire. Incline my heart to your decrees, and not to unjust gain. Turn my eyes from beholding falsehood. Give me life in your way. Fulfill your promise to your servant, which is for those who fear you. Turn away the reproach that I dread, because your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your commandments. By your righteousness, enliven me. The second reading today comes from the book of Romans, the 13th chapter. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 18th chapter beginning in the 15th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us take a moment to pray. When I was a little kid, just starting out in school, an older boy named Lars used to gather his gang and tease me mercilessly. I had wide, crooked eyes that were surgically corrected soon after. Despite the teasing, I have to admit, I kind of had a crush on Lars. When I wasn't crying because of his cruelty, I was gazing at him adoringly. He was tall, with blonde hair and huge blue eyes. Maybe I saw something more in him. Because when I heard about Lars years later, it turned out that he'd become, hear this, a social worker. Lars the bully. How did the bully end up as a social worker? In middle school, there was a mean girl who targeted me as her victim. And yes, you figured out by now that I had a hard time as a kid. I admit it. Now, this girl was skinny with an angular face and a really sharp wit. But in high school, I got to know her a bit better. And I learned more about her sharp wit as well as her sound mind. 
because Kathy directed me in a little one-act play and taught me more about acting than our drama teacher did. She turned something around for me. There was so much more to Kathy than was revealed by her dysfunctional behavior in middle school. Whenever an offense occurs, I've learned, there are really two victims, the perpetrator and the injured party. That's because when the offender strikes out, she's hurting herself as well as her target. She's better than that. He's got more potential than that. And the target of the offense, well, she deserves better too. This is something for us to think about as we turn to Jesus' teaching on conflict resolution in the church. It may seem to us as though this difficult teaching comes out of the blue. Actually, we've skipped a bit since last Sunday's reading, and it might be helpful today to turn back a few pages and see the connections. Earlier in Matthew 18, when his disciples asked him who was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, we see Jesus holding up a child, a vulnerable little kid, like me in those days of being bullied. We should note the children in those days weren't the spoiled apples of their children, their parents' eyes. They weren't shepherded to soccer and gymnastics and violin class, wearing cute clothes from Gap Kids. Children were insignificant until they had demonstrated that they could survive and were capable of contributing to the household. So the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one of least value or the most vulnerable. You know the character in a book or a movie you automatically know might get killed off because he's not the love interest or she's not the heroine, the disposable character, I call it. That one is the greatest in the kingdom. Holding that child, Jesus says, if any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks or offenses as I believe the King James has it. So we know as we return to our gospel that Jesus takes offenses very seriously. They reverberate not only in the church, but in the whole world. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. You are more than this, Jesus is saying. You are better than this, and you must be. I have called you to a high purpose. The church is my word for the world. That's what makes the process Jesus outlines for conflict resolution so important. If we want to be faithful to God's call, we must dare to address dysfunction in our own midst, in what we might call the church family. It's, it's not so much that we must follow Jesus' direction to the letter. It's rather that we must understand the importance of having a process for handling abuses or perceived abuses even. And remember that Christ is with us as we go through the process. Although Jesus doesn't speak of love in describing this process, he promises to be present. So we know that love is here in the midst of conflict, in the midst of hurt. Love is here. We might borrow this word from Paul in our epistle for today. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. If we are blessed to have a friend, even one single friend, who tells us difficult truths, even when we don't want to hear them, we understand that speaking the truth in love makes us better. In the church, we learn to speak truth to one another, always in love. Although when we speak to another in the church, one-on-one, -on -one, even as Jesus suggests, we're not lone rangers. 
We do this together as a community. And note how direct the process that Jesus outlines is. He asked the injured party to go directly to the offender. We should note that when the injured one doesn't feel safe to speak, we should be able to support that person by coming along or witnessing on his or her behalf if necessary. But clearly this process doesn't allow tail-bearing, what we sometimes call triangulation. This is when one person asks another to fix his problem, or when one person comes to another with an indirect message. You know, Pastor, there's some people who are unhappy. Hmm. In a healthy and loving church, we should not fear to address our concerns directly, like friends who speak the truth in love. The process Jesus outlines doesn't allow for blaming or shaming. It assumes that the person who perceives the problem is willing to become part of the solution. The first step in resolving an issue is to communicate openly and lovingly. Lastly, note how often the word listen appears. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen, even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Which, by the way, does not mean banishment. It, it could mean that this person may come to church, but will be viewed in the same way. We might view a prospective convert rather than a confirmed member. If this process seems to be empowering an accusation or attack on a church member, we should remember, well, two things. <laughs> That the one who must be listened to, the one for whom other church members are possibly advocating, is one who feels an injury. The church is coming together on behalf of a vulnerable member. The least of these is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And two, the church is also inviting the stronger member into greater faithfulness. You, brother, you, sister, are better than this. So why does Jesus share this teaching now as he advocates for the most vulnerable and prepares his disciples for the way of the cross? And why is it important for us now? For one thing, it's possible that our perspective has become skewed, like Jesus' disciples elbowing each other out of the way as they look to become greatest in the kingdom of God. We sometimes miss Jesus' message and our own call as the church. This is natural. We're into the sixth month of our exile, splitting at the seams. We are fearful and frustrated. We all feel vulnerable. And some of us may really begin to be feeling like accident victims. We may feel like the injured ones. And feeling this way at the mercy of so many frustrations and so many hostile forces, we are not in a good place to listen. Yet in the church and beyond the church, our call is to open our ears, to listen to the least of these, the most vulnerable in the church in the world. So we may need to do a reality check. We may need to review our situation. We are pooped up by the pandemic with its restrictions, and yet most of us are not actually sick. Most are not victims of the virus. We are frustrated by the situation of the church and the nation. So many things, so many things just don't seem right. We want to come back to our traditional worship gathering, and we may feel critical of those who are trying to bring us back but not in the way we want or along our timeline. We are disturbed by the social unrest, the demonstrations, the killings, and the cries from both sides. And yet most of us are not at risk of our lives. We aren't standing on the front lines of medical care or demonstrations or policing. 
and most of us are safe on our own streets and in our own homes. We are not the vulnerable ones. To see ourselves as victims is a trap that allows us to blame others for our troubles. As we try to avoid this process in the church, along the lines of Jesus' teaching for today, we can see the victim mentality playing out with catastrophic effect in the nation. Then it becomes very important for us as the church to witness to a better way. We are more than this. We are better than this. This state of affairs, all of it, this state of affairs is not necessarily our fault. And yet, since we are church together, even what is not our fault may become our responsibility. That is, we must view ourselves as able to respond. We are not victims, and we do not stand on the sidelines. We are called and uniquely equipped to respond. We are equipped because Jesus has called us, and because despite our differences, and even the same political differences that divide the nation. Within the church, present within the church, despite these differences, we are indeed church together. We are called to listen to one another. We are called to listen most especially to the vulnerable in our midst. And we need to ask ourselves honestly, truly, who the most vulnerable are, and who are the victims of injustice in our church, nation, and world. Today, the concerns of Black Lives Matter have come to Rochester, where we have learned of the death by strangulation at the hands of police six months ago of a black man, Daniel Prude. Is it Prude? Prude was in the throes of a psychotic break. Thus, even if his behavior appeared then to be violent, he was also a vulnerable one. And mental illness, among others, is something that, that makes us terribly vulnerable. Our bishop lives in Rochester, I believe. It's in his synod, our synod, and it's his parish. It's not our fault that this man died. And yet, can we listen to the voices that need to be heard? Can we listen without defensiveness? Can we believe ourselves to be part of the solution, not individually guilty, but collectively able to respond to the concern? Can we listen to one another can we listen to our own hearts speak in our congregation and in our own neighborhoods? Can we ask for people's stories? Black women and white men, officers of the law, demonstrators, medical workers. Can we listen? From listening may one day come agreement. Christ is with us. May we be church for the world. Amen. Trusting the power of our God, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. We give you thanks for the diligent leadership and faithful service of those who lead our church and our congregation. We pray for bishops Elizabeth and John, the leaders of the churches in Zimbabwe and Zambia, our missionary Karen Anderson, and Pastor Susan for leading us in worship today. Let your light shine through them as they guide us in our service to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our parents, teachers, and school administrators as schools begin this week. The uncertainty of what school will look like has led to increased anxiety and fear amongst all. Guide us to make decisions that are right for our families and to respect the decisions made by others. Help us to treat each other with grace and patience. 
In these unsure times, we are thankful for your continued, never faltering presence in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we give thanks for the great love you have for us. Even when we doubt ourselves, believe we are not good enough for you, or feel our sins are too great, you do not abandon us. Your love for us knows no bounds and heals us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Forgiving God, you never leave us when we fail to abide by you. You are always present and offer us unlimited opportunities to turn to you and follow you. Your forgiveness of us and unequivocal love for us knows no bounds. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, in these times of discontent, remind us of our obligation to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. If we love our neighbors as ourselves, we help to ensure that the needs of all are met. By meeting the needs of those around us, we show the love God has for each of us, regardless of the differences between us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we give thanks for the opportunity to worship with our community of believers. We look forward to worshiping in person again soon. With your grace, we can continue to weather this pandemic and rise as an even stronger community of faith. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God, you are a comfort to so many. Your love soothes the afflicted, comforts the distressed, and consoles the bereaved. Awaken hope in all who hear the good news of Jesus Christ, especially those who are hungry, anxious, oppressed, despairing, and sick. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ dealing with COVID-19, whether sick, healing, or helping those afflicted with the virus. We pray for Dick, Pastor Susan Salmon, Barb, Bob, Eleanor, Michelle, Kathy, Lisa, Irene, Tina, Carol, Evelyn, Bentley, Mason, and Jackson, and for those you may now need love. Refresh within us the promise that you will destroy death and that with all the saints we will live forever in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Friends, we thank you for your faithfulness as we invite you into the time of offering. And as you consider the many needs of the church as well as your own discipleship, perhaps consider what is on your heart where the church is concerned and if there is something of yourself that you can contribute to that process. Let's take this time now to prepare our offering.
come now to the time where we would typically be celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion. And in this service, we cannot commune in the traditional way. Yet we know that God is present. Christ is with us. And through God and Christ, we are met here and we are being transformed. So let us pray together the prayer of spiritual communion. Jesus, I want to receive you, and I cannot do it in a sacramental way. Therefore, I ask you to come to me and fill me with your presence, your peace, and your love. Grant me, Lord, the graces I need most, and make me one with all your faithful people everywhere. And let us pray together now the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hear now this blessing. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.